Well, it is right up seven o'clock, so I think we should get started and uh, welcome everybody to our uh, last night of this panel discussion. I uh, hope it's been uh, a good previous five weeks and I anticipate that this one will be uh, a really useful uh, topic and a useful conversation tonight as well. So what I want us to do is uh, get started by watching the video. This is on the question of hellish experiences and and then of course that leads to questions as, such as how could a good God even send somebody to hell and what do we do with um, uh, unpleasant experiences uh, even on this earth and uh, think about the goodness of God. So let's uh, watch this video, at least uh, the first 13 minutes of it, and then we'll start talking. As I mentioned the last uh, couple of weeks when we watched the video, there will be a portion in it where it's suggested, uh, some questions pop up on the screen and it's suggested that we pause it at that point, but we're not going to pause it. So it might be a little awkward as we just wait in silence for the video to kick in again, but we're going to uh, wait until the end of the video to have our discussion time. So Mike, go ahead and get us started. I have an overdose. The ambulance comes, they pick me up, and all I remember is that they're loading me up into the back of the ambulance. And I hear this voice that says, just give up. I had known from some time in that afternoon that I was dying. I never thought to pray, never thought about God. I knew that there was no life after death, and so the thought of death was just extremely terrifying because it just means end. I went into a spiral of depression and it led me to active alcoholism at 21 years of age. My dad checked me into a hospital and the second night that I'm there, my vision instantly went black. I'm now down descending lower and lower into nothingness. I just keep falling and falling and falling. It feels like somebody grabs me and drops me in this outer darkness. And I start racing down this black tunnel. And so as I'm going down, the next thing that comes to my head is, oh my God, I, I died and I'm going to hell. The people encircled me and kind of started leading me. As we journeyed, I'm aware I can't see anything anymore. It's pitch black. One study done of people who reported near-death experiences and 23% actually had hellish experiences. So not every near-death experience is uh, blissful. At this point, I'm feeling more and more anxiety, more and more uh, pain than I even I, I felt on my worst day alive. There was no doubt in my mind, the hell of the Bible, this is where I am, this is where I'm gonna be forever. It's almost like there's an absence of hope, there's an absence of love, it's the absence of God. So I said, I'm not going any further. And they said, oh, yes, you are. So they started to tug at me and push at me. And then that became biting and tearing. And they were taking pieces of me. In my study of these hellish near-death experiences, a high percentage of people go on to make positive changes in their life. They become better people. They learn to face that fear, guilt, anger, those negative things they were dealing with in their life before they had that experience. I get to this place of desperation where I cry out to the Lord and all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord comes down and I feel the presence of God. And in that place, I heard a voice. The voice said, pray to God, our Father who art in heaven. I remember like these phrases out of prayers and the people around me absolutely can't bear it. They would retreat further and further away. A thought comes into my heart, just one word. And so I yell, yes, into nothingness. I realized at that moment that who I said yes to was Jesus. So I was saying yes to him, and he was giving me that second chance. Well, today we're talking about a very challenging subject, hellish NDEs. This raises some uncomfortable and difficult questions. If we're gonna look at the positive NDEs, we have to explain or understand why these hellish ones exist. But stick with me, I think you'll agree, this is both important to understand and can be incredibly hopeful. First, according to one study, up to 23% of NDEs fall into the hellish category. That's a lot. And most researchers believe it's underreported because people are both embarrassed and traumatized by it. For most of us though, hellish NDEs make us wonder how it's possible for a loving God to allow such suffering on earth and then send people to hell. Why? It makes no sense. Well, let's think it through. Pain and suffering are universal to human experience. I mean, in some ways, it's the most normal, natural thing about life on planet Earth. Everyone suffers in some way eventually. 
physically, emotionally, relationally. And yet, ironically, it's the one thing we complain about and feel is somehow out of place and wrong. Even famous atheist philosopher Bertrand Russell once said, three passions, simple but overwhelmingly strong, have governed my life. The longing for love, the search for knowledge, and the unbearable pity for the suffering of mankind. Now, before we dive into how these hellish NDEs might help us find hope, even in our suffering, let's stop to discuss our personal feelings about suffering. Reports of hellish NDEs are common around the globe. In fact, Dutch cardiologist Dr. Pim van Lommel says this of hellish NDEs. To their horror, they sometimes find themselves pulled even deeper into the profound darkness. The NDE ends in this scary atmosphere. Such a terrifying NDE usually produces long-lasting emotional trauma. The exact number of people who experience such a frightening NDE is unknown because they often keep quiet out of shame and guilt. Now, Jesus taught about this hellish outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. How do we make sense of these experiences, though? And, and how might this also help answer why God would allow all the pain and suffering and trials of this earth? Well, in a very strange way, I believe this gives us great hope that God is making something good out of all this pain and suffering and evil. First, the concept of hell shows up in some form in most every one of the world's religions and cultures. It's been in the back of the mind of humanity for all time. And most systems of religion or philosophy seek to temper evil through some balancing of good versus bad deeds or positive thinking over negative thinking. The problem is it leaves everyone living in fear. What if my bad outweighs my good? How can you know? Who can know? Jesus taught that God does not desire for us to live in fear. God doesn't want anyone to perish in hell, but for all people to be with God in heaven for eternity. Jesus said, it's not my heavenly Father's will that even one of these little ones should perish. So why hell at all? Well, according to biblical accounts, hell was originally created for rebellious angels. Angels like humanity were created by God with a free will. Some who freely rejected God's love, light, and life eternally Hell was the only place where God eternally gives free-willed creatures what they want when they don't want God's will and ways leading their lives. Hell is the absence of God, the only place God stays out of the way for eternity, a place where angels and people fight for my will be done with no restraint from God, a place void of the light, life, and love of God. And the question always comes up, how can a loving God allow such pain and evil and suffering in this life? Then send people to hell for eternity. How is that fair? I mean, to punish a few temporal sins for all eternity? But that's actually an upside down understanding of the situation. What if instead God knows that we are actually eternal creatures, just like the angels? But unlike the angels, God mercifully lets us begin in a finite temporary existence where we experience the knowledge of both good and evil, of heaven and hell, but all greatly reduced, so that we will freely choose God's love forever. In other words, so we won't make the eternal mistake of the fallen angels. The point of suffering is to provide us a choice under restricted conditions before it becomes irreversible, to choose to love and follow God or to choose not to. God says he will honor either choice. But suffering reminds us, in fact, shouts at us, something is missing. The will and ways of God are missing on this planet. You know, we mostly seek my will, my ways. I mean, I do, I don't know about you. We live in a world where wills are at war. No wonder Jesus taught us to pray, your will be done, God, on earth as it is in heaven, because it's not often done on earth and not ever unless we're willing. Listen to how Crystal went through so much suffering, so wanting to ask God why, and then she got to. When I died at the age of 33, I died with a lifetime of secrets and shame that went with me. Things that I had never told anybody, um, especially the sexual abuse that I endured as a child. And it was during those that period of my life where I would go to church and I would listen to them talk about 
this loving father. I could not wrap my mind around this loving father that they tried to convince me that he was because where was he? When I called out and begged him to stop the abuse that was happening to me. When I died and when I found myself in this beautiful light with angels standing to my left and the presence of God to my right, and I turned to face him. And in that moment, I knew that he had loved me, that he had never left me in those moments, that each time I called out for him, he was right there with me. He explained that the horrendous things that I had gone through as a child were not done at his hand, that he gifted humans with free will and that it was the free will of a human that had hurt me. He did something that therapy had never been able to do. He freed me from the lies that I allowed myself to believe. You know, hellish NDEs remind us justice will be done. I mean, do you want people in heaven who hurt people with their evil deeds and still want their will, not God's will done? How would that be heaven? Some people are just not interested in following God and surrendering their will. Justice requires that they be given their own place to live with that choice, apart from the love and life and light of God. That's not God's will for anyone. Many worldviews teach that we must earn heaven and not do wrong or else fear hell or go through endless cycles of trying harder life after life on earth. Jesus actually taught that heaven is a gift for all who simply turn back to God's love, receive his forgiveness and leadership, and NDEs actually confirm this. Jesus came to pay for all our wrongs so that relationship with God is a gift. We don't have to earn it. Actually, we can't. Jesus said it this way, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. See, God doesn't want us to fear condemnation or hell, but he also doesn't force us to love or follow him. You can't force someone to love you and neither can God. So we live for a time experiencing a taste a taste of heaven, but greatly reduced, and a taste of hell, greatly reduced, in hopes that we will realize God is missing. Seek God and choose God, and then let God's love lead us as we follow his will more and more. You know, God has removed every barrier between us and himself except one, our free will. Our pride is all that can keep us separated from God. But God loves us enough to pay for justice, so that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Indie ears speak of a border or a boundary. They knew that once they crossed, they couldn't come back to earth. Because they hadn't crossed into eternity fully, the people you just heard from still had a chance to call out to God. Listen to their experience. As I'm thinking about, there's no hope, there's no way out. This memory comes of myself as a little boy sitting in a Sunday school classroom singing, Jesus Loves Me. And I could see myself vividly, so innocent, so sweet. I thought, enough of this, I'm done. I don't have anything else. Jesus, please save me. And when I said that, hands and arms emerge out of this impossibly beautiful white light. In that light, I could see me and all the gore, and I was roadkill. These hands and arms came out and they reached down and they touched me, and when they touched me, all that gore began to just dissolve and I became whole. As I cry out to the Lord and I say, God, I need you, it feels like everything just kind of stopped. It's just me and God now having a conversation. I feel his peace. I feel his love. I feel his presence. I yell yes into nothingness. I yell yes. As soon as I do, I'm instantly back. But this time in the hospital room, there's tangible peace in the room. And I see written on the wall a Bible verse. It's the verse John 3.16. And it was glowing. It was white hot. You know, John, a follower of Jesus, has a vision of heaven where the angels sing this of Jesus. You were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. It's a picture of God's new family. That was where you want to stop it, right? Yeah, he, and he's uh, coming to the end of the video uh, at that point anyway, so that's a good, a good place to, 
to uh, stop, uh, especially with the, uh, I've forgotten the young man's name, but the young man who pointed out that as he woke up in that hospital room and somebody had taped John 316 on the wall. And uh, that's, a, that's a, a good thing for us to reflect on. We're gonna re actually reflect on that verse a little more in just a moment. So uh, once again, uh, just kind of go around these uh, panels and I'll introduce everybody. We've got Amy and we've got Sheila, we've got Katie, we've got Jim, and we've got Mike uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the panels visually. And uh, we have another, I think six or seven people, last I checked, who are uh, in by way of um, the uh, chat feature. So when we first started this uh, six weeks ago, uh, I know I was certainly still fairly new to the Zoom platform, and we didn't quite know exactly how we would be able to uh, uh, have a Zoom conversation over this. We didn't know how many people would want to come in on it or anything like that. So um, I just suggested what we would do is we would have a group of panelists who would uh, be able to talk about this on the video screen, but uh, everybody will be encouraged to uh, participate by either answering the questions uh, in, by using their keyboard or asking some questions of their own by the use of the keyboard. And we'll try to keep up with those questions or those comments uh, as they come in on the chat feature as well. So somewhere around 24%, I think I remember the number was about 24% uh, of those having a near-death experience reported a, a hellish experience, which um, actually, uh, the researchers have begun to think that a number of more hellish experiences have gone unreported. Why do you think that is? What, what would make somebody hesitant or reluctant to talk about a hellish experience if they had one? Well, if they I'll don't say. believe they're saved through faith, then they probably would believe that it reflects in some way on their behavior. Here. Um, because if you believe that being a good person leads you to heaven, then what leads you to hell? Yeah, the shame of it. I mean, think about it. Oh, I'm on my way to where Hitler is uh, or some other super mm -hmm. person. And uh, I've never put myself in that category. And I sure don't want other people to think that about me. So, you know, the shame factor would be, uh, I think, a big, big issue. Yeah. And also just the fact that, you know, it's, that's not necessarily going to be an experience that you want to think about and, you know, relive to other people <laughs> as much. So probably would be a lot harder to talk about it than, I mean, I think, I think it's probably hard to talk about even positive and the experiences, but think negative ones would be even harder. I would, I would think, and just the um, uh, trauma of the experience, uh, the interviewers on uh, the, this video series, or the interviewees on this video series, um, it was actually uh, almost uh, uh, PG rated, you know, but if you read the book, uh, the little 90 page book we were handing out, What's After Life, or the larger book it was based on, Imagine Heaven, uh, they go into much greater detail on the printed page and it, it's incredibly disturbing to read. So you can imagine uh, recounting that and reflecting on it would have to be, uh, would have to be really tough. Mm -hmm. Well, in explaining the idea of divine judgment to people, I've sometimes used the uh, illustration of identity theft. So if, if you've ever been even briefly the victim of identity theft, somebody pretends to be you and using your credit card to make purchases and do certain things online and that kind of thing. And of course you, you hate the fact that uh, somebody's using your money for that purpose, but uh, in some instances you might be able to recover that. But if you found that people were actually in your name making purchases that you wouldn't at all make or 
were going to certain websites that you would never, you know, show up at, you would bend over backwards to try to communicate to people that, you know, my identity has been stolen. This is not me. And um, I've used the analogy before with people that that really is uh, a good way for us to understand why God would be offended at our sin and our failure, because if we are made in his image, we are in effect in everything we do saying to the universe, take a look at me. This is what God looks like. And so our selfishness, um, our uh, uh, using people instead of caring for people, um, just all, all the things that, that we do, we're uh, kind of declaring to the universe, we're the image of God. This is what God looks like. So he's, of course, uh, offended at how we have misrepresented who he is as his uh, image bearer. So that's the, um, that's the image that I've, I've often used or the illustration I've often used is that, uh, and, and by the way, and uh, Jim Steed will appreciate this, I actually uh, stole that unapologetically from R.C. Sproul. That's an R.C. Sproul illustration, Jim, but... Um, Good source. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, so, is that, a, is that useful, or do you have a, a way that you like to communicate to people, you know, just why God... I think the thing that people struggle with is, what am I... Yeah, okay, I might be hurting myself, and in some instances, I may not be terribly hurting myself, but why am I... You know, the Bible seems to be saying that I'm hurting God by doing these things. And I don't get that. Why is he so mad about the things that, that I do that he perceives as wrong? And so this illustration of us as cosmic identity thieves has always sort of helped me understand why God would be uh, uh, defending his glory and defending his honor by being offended at us uh, misrepresenting him. Does that help? Or would you have a better, uh, a better analogy uh, to help people understand this? Tom, I've used one of yours many times about the partially fresh eggs in the omelet um, that that you wouldn't stop at eating at a restaurant that had where they advertise the eggs as you know made it partially some of the eggs are fresh and some aren't. Uh, rather than offending God, uh, it seems like when I've been asked that, I, I've talked about the understanding of how holy and pure and what infinite goodness really is. And the fact that you can't have partially unfresh eggs in the presence of perfect holiness in order to be in God's presence uh, in eternity, you, you, you have to be completely washed clean. And so um, those that don't take the opportunity to be washed clean by Christ's blood miss the opportunity to be in the presence of perfect holiness. And, and it's just unacceptable to be in any other state when you're in God's presence. So you, you, you don't pass the test. Someone else, have you found it uh, that you're maybe a little stumped by this when somebody's, the whole reason they don't feel the need for uh, forgiveness, they don't feel the need for this, the message of the gospel is that they're not so bad as all that. Why would God be upset at at them, their neighbors like them, their boss just gave them a promotion. Well, in just a really simplified way of thinking, if you give someone a gift, especially a gift that you you really took some time and thought was special, special had them in mind when you bought it or when you made it, and they cast it aside, it's it's going to be hurtful, and that's such a that's such a minor. Um, in, in comparison to what to the sacrifice that Christ made and that God made for us, and so to take that sacrifice and cast it aside uh, as as untrue or or insignificant, I can see that grieving God. And then the damage that we do there there are, you know there's a there's a saying that we are the only Bible that some people will ever see, and it's really true. I, I've, I've talked to a number of friends who are um, have a, an anger and a hatred toward the church because of what they've seen the church do or condone mm -hmm. or because of an individual who claimed to be a Christian and the way they behaved. And so we, we do have a, a great responsibility and it's, it's a kind of a double-edged sword. We'll never be Jesus. We'll never be 
perfect and we'll never stop uh, doing and saying things that hurt our testimony. But when we, when we claim to be a Christian and then damage our testimony or dam damage God's uh, image toward um, unsaved people, I think that's, that's especially griev grievous to God. Yeah, I've, I've always tried to relate to just what a sense of justice comes from. And usually typically it's our own sense that we make up, right? We, we get mad about some things and not bad about, not mad about others and what we have. And then I try to relate that. Well, if God's the creator of the universe and he's given us the 10 commandments. And I usually go to that because nobody's held to all the 10 commandments. And it's usually a, a quick code to go to beyond, you know, the new Testament, expanding that out completely further. It's just usually a great place to go to say, well, if God's given us this code and it's his sense of justice, he's created it. And we follow to that. We've got to, to look to that and, and know that we have fallen short and that there would be punishment for that. Just, you know, when, uh, your neighbor leaves dog poop in your yard, right? That's the big thing right now with all the dogs in my neighborhood and everybody <laughs> getting online and going crazy and mad about that, right? Since the justice, you know, we need to find them, kick them out of the neighborhood, whatever they want to happen, happen with what that would be. Well, you know, sin is serious. It's disobedient to God and how he feels about what he's had. And then we've kind of stolen that from him with that identity theft deal. But interesting enough, God chose to take on that identity and pay the penalty for us. You know, I, I love that analogy. I think it flips back the other way so well in that he came to take on your identity and pay the penalty for it. So it's, I think when people get lost of so God's justice needing to have that penalty and what to have is one didn't come without the other. God is both just and merciful at the same time. He demands the justice. It's not as if the sin just disappears, because I think sometimes that's the way we want to make, you know, poof, it's gone. No, it was paid for. It was there. It happened. There has to be a real sense of justice that happens. You know, we, it's, you know, so, um, so as I look at that, I, I try to get, where's your sense of justice? Well, if we move to God's sense of justice, we got to look at what his word says. Now, do they believe God's word or not? That's a whole nother debate, but we got to look at, Hey, that's what we know. And so usually I try to lead to that point and then pray that their faith leads them to, Hey, God's word is true. Um, in the conversation. Good. But while we're um, having this conversation and recording this conversation, we've got this uh, storm coming over Austin and, <laughs> It's just going to be uh, interesting uh, because all of us are different parts of Austin. We've got Jim and Sheila down toward the Terrytown area, and um, we've got Katie pretty close to where the church building is, and uh, Mike and Amy and I, uh, yeah. what, about 10 miles to the north of the church building. So it's going to, it's all going to sweep over us at different times. Hopefully the, uh, uh, the electricity will stay on for this last interview uh, one of those things we're going to actually have to have in order to successfully have a <laughs> visit but so the people interviewed in the video were given a chance to turn to jesus and they took it and so does that tell us that we will we'll all have a second chance after uh after death to turn to god and whether your answer is yes or your answer is no uh please explain no <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go with no right away because it says in the Bible, and I, I don't know the reference, but it says you don't know the day or the hour that he'll come. And so you may get a second chance. You get you may get multiple chances over your entire lifespan, and you may get one. You just don't know what you're going to get. And that, that makes it not only important for us to recognize Christ and accept him as quickly as possible, right? But it also puts a lot of... Um, importance on us and telling our stories and witnessing to others like Sheila said we're the only Bible some people will ever see or experience and so it makes it very important that we be walking the path we should be walking as well because we we don't know how many chances somebody's going to get and I'm going to mute myself because this storm is right on top of me that's why I'm muted all the time <laughs> 
Oh, that, that was a good answer. Somebody else, uh, these people have had a near-death experience. It was a hellish experience. They cried out to, they had something in the back of their mind that they remembered and cried out to Jesus, and all of a sudden, it turned into a heavenly experience. So, Well, I, I would say with the people that, that took advantage of that, of course, obviously, uh, and omniscient God knew that they were the ones that, those particular people were the ones that were going to take advantage of it. But of course, the three that he showed were three that took advantage of the experience. But um, there, I would, from what I've seen or read, uh, many, many people do not take advantage of, of the experience. So that, that even makes it more mysterious about uh, why people have this experience both positive and negative and some people take advantage of it and some people don't. I, I don't know, you know, we'll know someday why that happens. Oops, looks like it wiped Tom out. And yeah. I guess it did. All right, yeah. now I get to jump in, I guess. <laughs> Go for it, Mike. Thanks, I'm sorry. No, were you gonna say something to that question, Katie? Or not? Um, you're, you were just commenting on I don't Tom. Know. I, I think I was reacting to that, but maybe I had something to say too. I don't know. We'll find out. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I I think this is interesting because I never really like before today I hadn't really like considered it this way. Um, I mean, these people weren't weren't actually dead. Finally dead. Um, so, I mean, I, I would think that for people who were up until the point that you were finally dead, certainly there could be even, you know, you know, it could be a last second decision. I mean, that's what this, these experiences at least seem to right. indicate to me. Um, I mean, as far as beyond that, um, yeah, I don't. I mean, I can't think of any scriptural proof for that, um, but, you know, I think that God is probably the only one that knows for sure. Well, I think uh, my answer and Diane commented to like this, you know, why would these new experiences need to be if somebody was died? Well, I think there may be dreams. And she mentioned, why couldn't it be dreams? And I think, so this would be one way that I think God he com communicates his ultimate truth through his word. We understand, but we can get insight from others and, you know, just our climate mm -hmm. environment, what we see, um, but as well as dreams can help point mm -hmm. us to truth. And so I think these would be a glimpse in that aspect and that, you know, just as somebody mm -hmm. else can give us a word of truth that fits within the realm of scripture, again, scripture is the basis for everything. Uh, these near-death experiences, uh, dreams, uh, somebody else's insight into our life can all point us to Jesus and what he would have for us. So I mm -hmm. think, I think that's a big part of what these experiences would be. Um, even though they are near death, they're not actual death. So that's a good distinction. You know, we've got one life to make the decision as Amy so eloquently put that we've got to realize that's what it is. This is just the an opportunity that God gave somebody through, you know, prodding them and pushing them in the spirit moving um, here on the earth, hopefully, as they go. Yeah, Gene pointed out, I don't think dream and being flatlined are the same thing. Um, and so, um, so yeah, so while uh, I guess I don't know what more about that. So I guess he would say, they're not exactly the same thing, but I think they could, God could use them and show them in the same way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I don't know. He can comment more on how he may disagree with that. I think there are people who put a lot of stock in dreams and there are people who think of them as just dreams. So I think God would know how to use that and who to use oh. that with based on what he's doing. But I think, you know, near death is a very traumatic experience. So people are in a place to have a life altering yeah. experience in that. And you know, I've, I've had friends who have said they've had life altering dreams. So you just, it could go either way, I think. 
Oh, definitely. I think there is, and I think, yes, Lord can use both, but the these on the video are not the same as dreams. Um, so I think they definitely would be different. And I think, you know, sometimes a lot of people have dreams. They can't remember them. There seems to be God speaking, moving in a certain way in these experiences, at least that we hear about, than what necessarily what um, we would hear about people's normal everyday dreams that they would have. Definitely agree with that. Well, I'm, internet's back on, so I'm able to be back on the call. But uh, I, that was the strangest thing. I asked you guys a question, and all five of you had this very thoughtful look on your face, and I waited for an answer, and then I realized the whole screen was frozen up. Y'all weren't thinking about your answer to the question. You weren't, I wasn't connected with you anymore. Yeah. I'm not capable of that kind of thinking, Tom. I, I'm telling you, all five of you, it looked like you were in some profound thinking there on the screen. But uh, so um, let me uh, jump to um, a, another question here. Things changed for the people on the video when they called out to Jesus. Um, in John 3 16 Jesus said for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life so God arranged a way out of our perishing I, I, you know this one of our most familiar and most cherished Bible verses it's interesting though that it's a it's a verse that assumes that we're in a state of perishing before Jesus comes as our rescuer you know some people think, you know, why, why would God be mad at me for uh, simply not believing in his son? And what, what I've, I've said to them in that instance is, well, that's, that's not the basis of God's anger toward us. You know, it's not like we're rolling along just fine with God and somebody tells us about Jesus and we don't accept Jesus. And God says, well, now I'm angry. You know, we're, we're in a, a state of perishing already. And so God so loved the world that he didn't leave us in that state of perishing, but he said, Jesus, um, but this idea of, of Jesus coming, as Mike mentioned earlier, you know, taking on our identity, it involved the substitutionary death of Jesus. And this idea offends some people. This is the question I'm moving toward. This idea that um, a death would be necessary and a substitutionary death at that is, is an offense. And there's probably a, several ways of answering this question, but why? Why is that offensive? I think a lot of people just do not want to acknowledge the authority of God, the holiness of God, and the sinfulness of man. And I think if you can't acknowledge those three things, people either take God lightly, and so they just don't see why a death would be required to pay for our sin and allow us into the presence of God or to have a relationship with God, um, because they don't, they, they take God too lightly and they take their own sin too lightly and they, they just don't want to, they just don't want to um, surrender. They don't want to bow the knee. And then I also have talked to a number of people who have a problem with, and I think we talked about this before with the um, exclusive nature of the, the gospel, the cross, and that that's the only way. And the, the substitutionary death of Jesus mandates that that be the only way it can't be both and so if you don't like the exclusiveness you're going to reject the fact that it, it had to be a death well i think you also you have to cons you know you have to uh, consider the old testament too i mean the whole the, the whole play the whole book was set up to be completely cohesive and so all of the um all of the sacrifices that had to be made uh, before Christ came was all just uh, an instruction as, and that, that God gave us that, that, that something had to pay for, for the atonement. And he set it up over, you know, throughout the, all of the teachings in the Old Testament so that we would, we would be aware of the necessity of this. And so that when Christ came and did it once and for all, it would be some concept that the Jews had never considered. Uh, it, it was, it was something that, um, you know, the groundwork had already been laid. And so, uh, 
that's pretty smart. Also, it just takes away this concept. You know, Sheila touched on one aspect of people who don't want to give up the things that they enjoy and they, they don't want to make the sacrifices that Christianity um, can can require of us. Because, I mean, it, it takes some discipline to, to be a Christ follower, right? But it also, for those people who really rely on the fact that they're good people and that their goodness is going to have, you know, an eternal effect, it takes that away from them. You know, it takes it out of their hands, their ability to, you know, proceed into heaven later. There's, there's one way instead of the multiple ways that they think there may be. And Sheila referenced that too. So, so con loss of control issue is, seems to, in my experiences uh, with people, seems to pop more, pop up more than any other, other reason. So just the unwillingness to give up the idea that you have control. Mm -hmm. Tim Keller, in one of his pithy quotes, says that the cross reveals to us that we are more uh, flawed and sinful than we ever realized, but we are more loved and accepted than we ever hoped. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, so the both the bad news about ourselves and the incredibly astonishing good news um, about what God wants to do about our bad news is all there together in the cross. I also think it's interesting that there seems to be kind of two extremes of this dynamic. I, I've my father for years, um, when my mom would talk to him about being a Christian, and he just said, I've, I've, "I'm too sinful. I'm too. I'm too bad." I, I would have to clean myself up before I could even, you know, come before God. I, I, I just, God could never forgive me. So there's that extreme where people think they're too sinful. And then there's the other extreme where people feel like they just are pretty okay. They're, they're just not that sinful. They don't need, they don't need to be saved. They don't need a, a sacrifice. And I think that's just a really uh, interesting picture of humanity where yeah. it depends on who we're comparing ourselves to. Well, the irony though is it's, it's the, it, it's two different fruits, but it's the same root. I mean, mm -hmm. to feel yourself too sinful uh, to be accepted by God or to feel yourself uh, uh, worthy enough to be accepted by God comes from the same place. And that is, it's up to us. And, mm -hmm. um, and there is a, I mean, really the, 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 the thing that Jesus uh you know, one of Jesus's famous parables, uh, it's known as the parable of the prodigal son, but it's actually a, a story of two sons. And one son was very, very bad, and he was lost because of his badness, but one son was very, very dutiful, and he was lost because of his goodness, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, but both of them were, uh, were lost. And the, and the irony of it, though, is at the end of the story, who's, who's on the outside looking in? It's the person who thought he was so good and so righteous and so offended that God would show mercy to this ruinous uh, prodigal son. And, uh, you know, really interesting parable because at the end of the parable, you don't know if this dutiful, obedient, older son is going to come around to his father's way of thinking. But there's another parable I want to uh, think about right now, though, that Jesus shared. And in, in one, in one of these uh, parables of Jesus, he describes two men entering the temple, one a Pharisee and one a publican. A publican was a tax collector, and that's not the equivalent of somebody who works for the IRS. A, uh, a tax collector at that time was a very, uh, very often a very corrupt individual because he could buy a franchise to, you know, collect taxes for the Romans uh, in the occupied, uh, the areas where Rome occupied. And so he was a Jew who was in effect collaborating with the hated Roman Empire, and he was extorting people, you know, taking more money than was necessary for his own fees and services. And, and uh, so to say somebody was a tax collector or a publican would be the same uh, in that day and in our days, say that somebody was a prostitute or something like that, just a very uh, uh, kind of morally outcast type of person. So here's this upright person, person who really is always trying to do the right thing, this Pharisee and this, pub and this publican. And they come into the temple and the Pharisee this is the Tom Goodman 
uh, paraphrase, but he says, God, aren't you lucky to have me around? You know, I do this, I do that, I, you know, see after this. These are all the things that, uh, that I do, and you must be really pleased to have me around. And the, the publican wouldn't even raise his eyes up to, uh, but he beat his breast, Jesus said, and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And the interesting thing about that parable is that, you know, parables give us a chance to see things from Jesus' perspective. And Jesus saw all of humanity in only two categories. You're either the Pharisee or you're the publican. You're the one who doesn't feel that you have any need of God's mercy or you're the one who cries out for it. And we really like to have a third role to play, every one of us. But the point is that if we don't see ourselves in, uh, in, as somebody who needs to cry out for God's mercy, guess, guess what role we're playing? We're the Pharisee, you know, who's saying, God, aren't you lucky to have me around? Um, why is our first instinct, when we think about being right with God, you know, when we think about, and, and by the way, I think that's an instinct that all of us have. You remember the closing uh, scene of the uh, movie Saving Private Ryan, where the whole movie is about all these people who literally gave their lives to enable Private Ryan to go home and live his life to an old man. And, uh, and so at the end of the movie, at the end of all this, this scene of sacrifice, now we know this old man at the, at the grave in, in Normandy is, is Private Ryan, and he turns to his wife in desperation and says, tell me I was a good man, you know, tell me I lived a good life. And so there just seems to be this, this need, this recognition that all of us uh, have to be affirmed uh, by the people important to us and by God. Why is the first instinct, when we think about standing before God, the first instinct is to list off all the things we've done that are right. Our first instinct is to list off uh, all our merits. Why is that our ins why, why is that the, the human first instinct? Well, I guess our natural instinct is to defend ourselves. And um, you know, if you're if you're sitting in the dock and but you want to convince the judge that you don't have to uh, suffer the penalty. You don't have to go to prison. But your instinct, I, I think, is to, if you're standing in the judgment, sitting in the judgment seat, I mean, your, your, your instinct is to convince the judge that you deserve to come out okay on this. I think we, we live our lives straddling two sides of this issue. On one hand, we know cognitively that Jesus made the sacrifice, Jesus paid for our sins. It's, it can't be of us or of our works. But then we step over that line a thousand times a day and take it back and, and try to live, try to be good enough, try to, we, we, we're, we swim in waters of merit in every part of our lives, school, competitions, athletics, work, everything we do in this world is merit-based. And so if we're not, um, if we're not spending a lot of time in the Word, if we're not spending a lot of time uh, hearing, hearing the Bible taught and studying it and having these conversations, we slip back into that merit-based economy. And we just have to keep disciplining ourselves to to go back to the truth of the Bible. Yeah. You know, first, it, it may seem with these last two or three questions I've, I've asked us to talk about that we've moved away from the subject of hellish experiences, but really the everything we've been talking about is, is really at the basis of, of why people would, I think, find the whole subject of, of hell um, offensive because it is the subject of judgment, it's the subject of God having an opinion about our behavior and our actions. And, um, and so I think if we get a clearer understanding of how to answer these last two or three questions we've, we've talked about, I think it moves us you know, inevitably to uh, a better understanding of, of why hell is even a subject in the Bible and, and why hell was so often a subject on the on the lips of Jesus, uh, he talked about it, you know, so very frequently. I um, 
I remember one time when uh, it was on a, a late afternoon, back in the day when Family Feud was a, a, a show on network TV. I think it's on some cable channels and everything, and it continues on these days, but it was on network TV. And I don't typically watch game shows, but um, apparently I was at an idle moment, and I was channel surfing, trying to find something to watch before before supper time and, and uh, hit Family Feud. That's what they all say, Tom. What's that? No. I said, that's what they all say. I, I say that all the time. I don't really watch that. Oh, that's I was just they channel all surfing. I was just channel surfing say. and happened to come across that. I'm, well, sure, I'm sure that's not the case for you. Hey, I, I, I'm seeking to justify myself like the Pharisee <laughs> in that story earlier. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but uh, Ray Combs was the uh, the, the person on, in charge at, at that time, the host at that time. And as as he would do on that show, he would go down the line and have the family members introduce themselves. And uh, and uh, to one particular guy, he, he pointed to a lapel pin that the guy was wearing. He said, what do those two question marks stand for? And immediately I put the clicker down. I wasn't going to channel surf anymore because I knew what those two question marks stood for. I, I wore a lapel pin like that too. I'd gotten trained in a program called Evangelism Explosion and uh, it's built around two questions and there are two question marks on a, on a uh, attractive little lapel pin that people used to wear in hopes of generating conversation like the one that started on network television where Ray Combs asked, you know, what do those two question marks stand for? And, and the guy said, um, and the guy said, well, they're, they're the two most important questions anybody could ever ask you. And Combs said, all right, well, what are they? And he said, well, the first one is, um, you know, if you died today, do you know for certain that you would uh, wake up in heaven? And, um, and uh, Combs laughed and said, I'm not going to answer that on national television. And he went down the line to continue to, you know, introduce the family. And then he looped back around to the guy and said, okay, I'll bite. What's the second question? And, uh, and the guy said, if you did die tonight and stand before God, and God said, why should I let you in my heaven, what would you say? And Ray Combs said, well, I'm the host of Family Feud, and everybody loves me. And everybody laughed, and the show went on. And, but uh, I just thought that was a really fascinating thing, that two really, really fundamental questions that would get people wondering about the gospel showed up on this, on this Family Feud game show. And those really are the two most important questions that anybody could ever be asked. Do you, are you confident that you will wake up in heaven when you leave this earth? And what's the basis for that confidence? Uh, is it that you're like the Pharisee in that story earlier, ready to list off all your good deeds and all your behaviors and all your merits? And this is why you're confident that God is going to let you into heaven or, um, are you basing it on something else? Are you basing it on, on, on what Christ has done for you and, and what Christ did to take away our sin on the cross? And um, we're, we're leaning on him as our savior, not just as our way shower and our example setter, but as our, our savior who was our substitute and bore away what, uh, what we did wrong on the cross so we could have a relationship with God. And what we see in these stories uh, 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 hellish near-death experiences and people remembering these little snippets of something that they sang in vacation Bible school or something they were told in youth camp and they just desperately clung, you know, reached out for it at that point, that, that even at that stage, even at that point, that God was ready to be merciful and ready to bring them to himself and, um, and I, I think that we can all learn from that and we can uh, take that to heart and learn from their experiences, learn from their stories so that uh, we can turn to God and have a relationship with him here and on into eternity hereafter as well. Um, every, um, every week what uh, we've been doing is uh, wanting to hear from different persons around the, the, the six panels, uh, your faith story, your testimony, and tonight would be uh, my night, my responsibility for that. And um, you know, I, uh, like several of you who, who have shared, uh, I was raised in uh, a Christian home, a, a church going home. My parents uh, were, were very active in church and very uh, clear in communicating 
uh, how to have a relationship with God from, from my earliest point. And when I was eight years old, I uh, placed my faith in what Jesus had done for me. And at the age of eight, of course, I would not, could not have had as maybe clear an understanding of, of that as, as you as you have as you move on into adulthood. But I knew the basics. I knew that uh, it wasn't based on what I did. It wasn't based on uh, how good a, how good a boy I could be. It was based on what God had done for me. Um, I, I remember vaguely, you know, uh, I'd often heard in, in, sun, in Sunday school and in church, you know, that it, it, it will from time to time cost you to be a Christian. And sometimes, of course, the stories would be from um, uh, times and parts of the world where there's great difficulty in making a decision for Christ. And uh, I remember uh, that uh, I thought I was actually facing one of those moments, you know, as an eight-year-old when I uh, shared my uh, Christian experience with uh, and my plans to get baptized with some of the uh, boys on my street. And uh, one of the typical bullies on the street uh, said, I inexplicably, I don't, under, I don't understand what was in his thinking, but he said, to, well, if you follow through with that uh, uh, next Sunday on Monday, I'm going to find you and beat you up. And I thought to myself, well, I'm going to have to be prepared for that as a Christian now, you know, and have to have to suffer accordingly, you know. So I, and it, and it sounds really uh, kind of silly looking back at it now, but in a little eight year old heart, man, I was, I was yeah. standing up for Jesus, you know, but um, I don't, I don't imagine that any of us listening to this or any who listen to it as a, as a recording later on can maybe identify with, you know, the whole process of, of what an eight year old's thinking was. But I can tell you that the gospel and receiving the gospel is not a one time experience. It is a first time. There's, there, there's gotta be a first time experience for somebody to, you know, to, uh, to know that they're to, to know that they're saved, to know that they're in a right relationship with God because of what God has done for them. There's got to be a first time experience. But I, I think throughout our lives, we rediscover the gospel, we rediscover the riches of the gospel and, and lean more deeply on it and more uh, dependently on it as we move through our lives. And I know that's true even into, you know, this stage of life uh, as well. Diane and I are, are empty nesters and uh, you know, we, uh, worked uh, hard, I think, and were very engaged and very sacrificial as parents to uh, 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 teach our boys what they needed to know about God and about making it through and, you know, doing what needs to, to, to happen to be successful as adults. And uh, as a number of uh, empty nester parents can uh, testify, our story is, at least at this stage, at this point, um, you know, we don't have a whole lot of fruit to show for that. I'll, I'll just be in broad and generic as possible at this point to, you know, maintain, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the uh, integrity of the, of the persons involved in this story. But, um, you know, if, if my whole identity uh, was wrapped up in, uh, I'm a good person because I'm a good parent, you know, uh, mm -hmm. my, my worth and my identity is found in the fact that, uh, you know, all the things I did for 20 something years as a parent have, have paid off now. And, and, and I feel good about myself because of what has resulted from that. Then, you know, my life would be at a point of, you know, absolute disappointment at this point, at this juncture anyway. But there's a verse in the Bible, uh, Psalm three, verse three, Oh Lord, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. And that's what the gospel can do in somebody's life is to know that it's, um, uh, it's for God's glory, and it's um, and and it's it's the work that God has done in my life that is glorious, not the work I've tried to do for Him. And it's interesting that when David, uh, King David, wrote that psalm, in which he he stated that this was um, at a stage in his life that was far far worse than you know anything I've experienced as an empty nester parent. David was basically an empty nester parent. Uh, the, uh, or, uh, as he talked about these particular experiences, but, you know, at this juncture, uh, his kids were an absolute disappointment. And like I said, his experience is far worse than some of my experiences, but boy, the traumatic stuff, it was a soap opera, what happened in David's kids' lives. Um, David's son, Absalom, rebelled against him and 
David had to run for his life out of Jerusalem. Um, David uh, was an adulterer. He had committed adultery with Bathsheba and actually had Uriah, the, the husband, killed so he could um, cover, try to cover this up. So if David's glory was in his authority and power, well, that was gone. He fled Jerusalem. If his authority was in being a good parent, that was gone, you know. Uh, if his authority was being this really moral man, that was gone, right? And, uh, and, and yet he said, oh, Lord, you are my glory and the lifter of my head. And, you know, you, you think of, of uh, your, your kid who's heartbroken and disappointed, and maybe you take him or her by the chin and lift that little face up to where you can look him straight in the eye, you know. And that's what David was saying that God was doing with, with him. And so I can tell you that, yeah, coming to Christ at the age of eight was, was as uh, fully real as I could possibly understand it at the age of eight. But, you know, I've, I've never outgrown the gospel. I've never outgrown the need to continue to look back on the cross as the place where that was where my worth was given to me. My, my, my worth is not found in what I do for him. It's not found in uh, what kind of uh, kids I can present to the world. It's not found in my health. It's not found in my, uh, my success. It's found in, in uh, what God has done for me, and that is enough. And, and so that would be something I would uh, want to commend to everybody because uh, of all the many, many uh, benefits that, that come to uh, us because of it. But you know, really, you, you think about it, and, and the longer we go through life, the the more that we have used to make us feel good about ourselves to make us feel successful to make us feel worthwhile slowly get taken away from us our beauty or uh you know our uh our careers or uh you know if our whole identity and worth is found in being a good mama a good daddy and you know, after 18 years of that, that, that goes away. You know, you're, you're, you're no longer doing that job anymore. Um, and so piece by piece, you know, the, the further we go through life, if our glory isn't found in something other than our accomplishments and our stuff, we're going to find our accomplishments and our stuff slowly um, not doing the job quite as satisfactorily as maybe we thought that, that they did in the past. So that's, uh, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. Well, everybody, thank you so much for uh, these six weeks together and all of you who uh, typed out your answers or listened in online as well. And um, I, uh, I expect that we'll probably do a few more uh, Zoom webinars and, uh, in view and, and try to involve a few more uh, panelists on the, on the screen now that we've gotten better and better at it. I think uh, more and more comfortable on using this platform, but this is a really convenient uh, way of pulling people together from as far south as Terrytown and as far north as Cedar Park and every point in between. <laughs> well, y'all, let me have a word of prayer, all right? Before, Emily, hey, Tom, I, hey, yeah. Tom, before we do that, uh, kudos to Mike for getting all the technical stuff working yeah. and, and pulling this off. Yeah, right yeah. Now, Mike, yeah. you're the yeah. right button. Un Thank unfortunately, you, yeah. uh, unfortunately, now you have the reputation. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So everybody's going to be coming to you every time now. You know that. So. Okay, Tom, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, I'm glad, you, I'm glad you highlighted that. Thank you. Well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm grateful for the chance to get together with uh, these uh, other five on the screen and the other, other nine to 12 that have been with us on uh, the chat feature throughout these weeks. I pray that you would help us to um, continue to ref reflect over these, these intriguing stories of people who've reported near-death experiences. Help us also uh, look uh, not to these stories for our authority of what the next life is about, but look to your word and compare these stories up against the standard of your word. We thank you for your word, which may not tell us all we're curious to know about the next life, but it tells us all we need to know about it and it tells us what we, uh, what you have done to enable us to have um, 
a right relationship with you on into that next life as well. We are so grateful to know that the benefits and the blessings of a relationship with you aren't simply waiting, only waiting for us in the next life, but those benefits and those blessings are ours uh, even now with your presence and your guidance and your power and the wisdom uh, that is available uh, to us as we call out to you because um, you are a God not only is waiting for us in the next life, but your God is present with us through all the joys and sorrows and challenges we face in this life. Lord, I pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. All right. Good night. Thank Good you so night. much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.